involved in the Gamergate controversy as a target, and she said, you can stop there, because I'm going to be explaining the rest of it. <laughs> so without further ado, Brianna Wu. Thank you, Brianna. Fantastic. I will follow that then. How's everybody doing? I, before we start, I want to hear how many people have had a conversation already that when you get back on Monday, you've got some work to do. Because I've already had those conversations. Do you? Yeah. That's the problem with these conferences. Like you meet too many talented people. So, um, Like I said, my name is Brianna Wu. I guess this slide is a little bit dated now, uh, because now I'm running for US Congress this year in Massachusetts. So um, I'm going on 100% feminist, uh, pro-LGBT, uh, pro-cybersecurity platform. So. I need to update that slide. Um, I usually give this talk in uh, an hour. We're going to do it a little bit uh, quicker. But you know, something I like to say before I start is you know, there's no woman in any professional field that likes to talk about this stuff. You know, for me, I worked my entire career to become an engineer, to become an expert on the Unreal Engine. So to stand up here and to kind of define myself by the harassment that I've received, I just want to let you know it's, it's difficult. It, it's not what I feel defines me. So I just always think that's really important to say. Like, you know, this is not something the women or you know, marginalized groups have experienced this. It's not something we really want to be talking about. So what we're going to be talking about today is uh, Gamergate. Uh, this is basically, it's equivalent of the KKK but from the uh, video game industry, basically. So we're going to kind of go into the origins of it. Uh, basically, in 2014 and 2015, Gamergate kind of took over a lot of the news media, and it certainly took over most of the game industry. Um, it really forced us to reckon with this legacy of being an industry that was really built for the comfort of a very certain kind of gamer and the social cost of what it was like trying to participate in that space if you were anything else. Uh, so this is that sad story that we're going to be telling. Games are changing. They're changing a lot. Uh, when I started my game studio in 2010, you know, women were 16% of gamers. If you go back a few years, uh, in 1992, this is the first study I ever saw on this subject, women were only 3% uh, of gamers back then. It's slowly been rising. Today, if you look at those numbers, women are 52% of gamers. And that's not mobile gamers. This is across all platforms, including PC. Your average gamer today is actually a woman my age, right? Like someone in her 30s or 40s. So, you know, games have really changed from this thing that was the domain of just, you know, kind of, um, you know, nerdy guys in their 20s. And this is a good thing. You know, it doesn't mean that we're not making those old kinds of games. You know, there's still plenty of blood-soaked games on the market to play, but we are expanding them. As a result of this, more women are getting involved in the game industry. This is a game right here. This is by my friend Jenna Hofstein. She's a game designer in Boston. It's just an utterly brilliant uh, educational game for children. And I think it's great that we're getting those kinds of experiences out there. So I want to kind of just briefly give the, the summary of how the kitchen caught on fire in the game industry. So there are people who have different opinions on this, uh, but for me, the moment that the game industry really began to need to uh, reflect on uh, our issue of women and how we're not treated fairly, began with the Neo Sarkeesian. Uh, you know, basically, if I'm recalling correctly, this was 2012, she brought out uh, a series of YouTube videos. And she put this out there on the internet. She wasn't super well known before this, but she was like, you know what, I'm going to put out a series of, uh, you know, basically documentary videos from kind of an academic perspective. And we're going to look at uh, how women are treated in games. And I remember when she announced this, what happened in the mainstream game community? It got really irrationally furious from the get-go. And there were all these assumptions that she was going to just like tear games apart. There were these sexist assumptions that she wasn't really a gamer. And you know, as a result of this, Anita ended up getting tons of death threats and rape threats. There's actually a well-known game developer in the industry 
that coded a flash gate where you would have a muted face and you would hit it and then there would be blood and beat up effects from it. You know, and as a result of this, you know, her Kickstarter did end up raising more money, but she kind of became the, um, you know, the, I'm trying to think of a different word, but hero, but she's a hero to me. Like the woman that kind of took a stand and said, no, we are going to look at how video games treat women. 2014 is really the year that all fell apart. Um, and I know a lot of us think Gamergate started with Zoe Quinn, but what I feel has really been erased before that is uh, what was happening in July, right before that. So for me, I had just uh, finished uh, shipping Revolution 60. This is a, a game that my studio has spent three years working on. So this was a point in the game industry where things were really, really, really getting bad. Um, this was a friend of mine. I'm going to hold her name from this talk so she doesn't get targeted because every time I mention her, people go after her. But uh, Giant Bomb has a really long history of not hiring women. And uh, in July, they had two people step down. Part of it was uh, because Ryan Davis had passed away and they hired uh, someone new to come to Giant Bomb. At this point, Giant Bomb had never in their entire history ever hired anyone that wasn't a uh, straight, presumably cis, white dude on the editorial team. And they came forward and lo and behold, Giant Bomb hired two more you know, straight, white, presumably cis men to work on their team. And a rather uh, well-known woman uh, game journalist uh, noticed this and put out tweets about it. And the response was horrifying, what happened to her. Giant Bomb fans went after her in a way that utterly churned my stomach to the point where she got up and quit the game industry. And I want to let you know, back in 2014, there really weren't that many women game journalists in the game industry. We were a lot more of a minority. We tended to know each other. So to see one of the very few colleagues that you have over on the press side really be run out, and more than that, to see Giant Bomb basically twiddle their thumbs and pretend like it's not their problem for three or four days, it was very, very disheartening. And what is so discouraging to me about this incident, which really hasn't been recorded historically, is this was when they came up with the playbook that we'll be talking about later. You know, Zoe Quinn incident, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version of it. Uh, basically, a former jilted lover of Zoe's had uh, written a, uh, just a fanfic about her and her life uh, called the Zoe Post. Put it out online. You know, if you switch the genders here, and it was a woman making these comments about a professional man, everybody would just call, you know, the woman all kinds of names. For some reason, this person was considered credible, and it really uh, started this very frightening assault on Zoe. This is somebody who for a while had gotten really frightening, uh, almost legendary abuse in the game industry. Um, but it really rose to the point here where we couldn't even have packs that year. Uh, there were people showing up with like t-shirt slogans, you know, slut shaming Zoe and doing all these other horrible things to her. Um, which leads into this. You know, I liked Firefly like everyone else when it came on. I thought Serenity was a great movie. But I would say what happened to Zoe is probably the most sexist incident in the entire history of video games. So this is Adam Baldwin who kind of played the sexist jerk on Firefly. And he puts out this piece of S video uh, basically going after Zoe and um, with some really malicious claims. You know, this is somebody that's very, very popular, very well known. So you have women in the game industry, they're just trying trying to do our job, being targeted by the mainstream. So right after this happened, what happened is there was kind of a playbook that Gamergate um, kind of had figured out at this point. The playbook is to make the cost of speaking out so high that women choose to be silent instead. So what they did was they found every woman in the game industry that would speak up about harassment or about our problems with hiring women in the game industry, and they went after us one by one until they silenced us all. So this is Jen Frank, Catherine Cross, Lee Alexander, Maddie Bryce. 
Uh, Jem Frank quit the game industry for quite a while. Lee Alexander is gone. Mandy Bryce quit for quite a long time. There's, I think she came back at some point. Uh, but basically, they found this playbook that worked. It was basically to attack us, to threaten us, to say they're going to rape us, to say they're going to kill us, to say they're outside your house with a knife, they're going to stab you, they're going to murder your family, to you know, make videos slandering you, to put all this stuff out there to just silence you into giving up. And it worked. This is what a friend of mine said, um, this was in October, about Gamergate. And I think this is really important to know. What I think about Gamergate that I can't say publicly is this. We are not winning, and if we do, it will be a pure victory. And this is dead on with what was happening that year. Because they had, Gamergate managed to frame the discussion where it really did seem like it was about ethics and game journalism to a lot of people. So, you know, the thing was, yeah, we're on 50% of an argument where you have a woman on one side saying, hey, I deserve to be here. I think we should hire more women. And then you've got this army of people going after her on the other side. It's just a formula that you just simply cannot win. And then they went after me. And this is my story with that. So a lot of women in the game industry kind of been more silent about Gamergate the entire time, hopefully like, because it was a good way to not get attacked. That's never been the way I've rolled. So uh, Older and Gamergate was fairly vocal, talking about it and criticizing it. So these are some of my tweets back then. This was back when I think I had 4,000 Twitter followers. Um, and a fan of one of my shows, Isometric, uh, had basically taken some of my tweets about Gamergate and turned them into this meme and uh, sent them to me. And I said, oh my god, that's hilarious. Uh, and I tweeted it out. And that utterly ruined my life, that one tweet. So what happened is I could tell things were going sideways on my Twitter uh, after I sent that out. Because like just the, the number of tweets and abuse I was getting was just going through the roof. And I'd never actually been on 8chan or really even understood what it was uh, before that night. But I went on 8chan and I saw them. And they were starting to get ready to run the playbook on me. So they started going through my life. They started going through my husband's life. They started investigating my family. They started getting personal information about me. They started finding my phone number. They started finding my address. And I'm watching all of this going down on 8chan as like the army is getting ready to attack me. And I tell you guys, this was, this was the defining point in my life. Because I'd seen this happen to other women, and I knew if I just closed the computer and I shut up for a few days, I knew it would just blow over. And there's actually a podcast I did that night, right before Gamergate. And, you know, I talked about how I just, um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Because I knew if I kept going, what happened to Zoe, what happened to Anita, what happened to all those other women was going to happen to me. And I talked to my husband. I asked myself if I would be able to live with myself if I just sat down and did nothing while my women colleagues were taking the hits for me. Yeah, I know that wasn't something I'd be able to live with if I did. So the next day, I opened up my laptop and I said, you know what, bring it on. And they did. So about two minutes after I said that, I got some of the most explicit death threats I'd ever gotten. I'm going to read these. Guess what, bitch? I now know where you live. You and Frank live at, and then they put my address there. I've got a K-bar, and I'm coming to your house so I can shove it up your ugly feminist cunt. I'm going to rape your filthy ass until you bleed and choke you to death with your husband's tiny Asian penis. How's that for terrifying, you stuck-up cunt? I'm, going, I'm sick of you feminist fucking asshats. Your mutilated corpse will be on the front page of Jezebel tomorrow, and there isn't jack shit you can do about it. If you have kids, they're going to die too. I don't give a fuck. They're going to be feminists anyway. I hope you enjoy your last moments alive on this earth. And that's where I called the police and I left my house. So, 
What happened next, I really couldn't have predicted. Um, every media organization in the world saw that tweet from me and started calling me. CNN, MSNBC, The New York Times, The Boston Globe, everybody. And I thought back to that Facebook post from my friend where she said, we are not winning, and if we do win, it's going to be a pure victory. And I knew that I had to stand up and let people know what was happening to women in the game industry. So even though I had been run out of my house, even though I was barely holding on emotionally, I said yes to every single media outlet that started calling me. And, you know, I used to work in politics before I was an engineer, and I wrote down my talking points of everything I was going to say on television. And I had one mission to get out to the public, to let them know Gamergate was a hate group. And I went to so many organizations in the world saying the same thing over and over again. MSNBC, CNN, PBS, BBC, NPR. I did documentaries. The Guardian did an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. CBC. I mean, it was just ridiculous. We counted up at one point. It was hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of interviews that I had done trying to get the word out that women in the game industry needed help. We needed the police to do their jobs. If you threaten to kill someone in the game industry, there need to be consequences for that. And I very naively believed at that point that if I stood up, if I made my voice heard, things would change. So, because this is the abridged version of this talk, you know, I want to stop right here. And I want to say, you know, the problem of where this comes from I think there's a lot of assumptions that we kind of believe the problem is these teenage boys living in their parents' basement. But that's not the real problem. The problem is the game industry itself. It's wildly sexist in ways we are barely beginning to address. You know, the truth is our industry has put out this product that is catered for a very, very specific set of the market. And it portrays women as one thing, and black people don't really exist there, and LGBT people, if we exist, we're kind of the butt of a joke. And it's this entire culture that makes more than movies, that's a huge industry, that kind of puts this one person at the center of the universe and tells them that no one else exists. And the problem is, even though there are so many great guys in the game industry, when we look at our hiring practices, they mirror these exact same kinds of bias. So, you know, I want to tell you what it's like to be in the game industry. This is a place that very, very strongly rewards your silence if you're a woman. If you're the kind of woman that will, like, let the guys there feel like they're not sexist and kind of go along with the boys club and empower it, you're going to do great. But the moment you start speaking out, you say, you know what, I think that character might be a little bit sexist. I wish you wouldn't make that joke. It makes me uncomfortable when you ask me out. The moment you set those boundaries, the more you find yourself kind of ostracized. And the truth is we desperately need feminist critics in the game industry. This is from the iOS release of Soul Calibur. This is on iPhone. You know, it's not that, you know, I'm a sex-positive feminist, but I think if you're going to put this out in a really, really major game release, I think, like, some criticism is fair. You know, game developers, we say all the time that we can't make our best product without honest feedback from our audience. This is a design that needs some honest feedback. <laughs> so, let's see, I don't have time to do that. Basically, um, Coming back to my story, you know, I started to get some of the most intense death threats ever. And it went on for a whole year. And it's still going on today as I'm running for office. I've had people telling me they were on their way there to my house, like people with known psychological issues that were wards of the state, sending me messages talking about the guns that they have, sending me videos of themselves driving to my house, saying they were going to kill me. Do you know what that's like when you're just trying to do your job and get a living? For me, you know, running a game studio is extremely expensive. 
So for me, uh, this was an attempt to take down my uh, studio's game, Revolution 60. So basically, they were going to pose as um, very angry consumers and basically harm my game's release. Uh, this was all over 4chan and Twitter. I have to tell you, the most weird thing that happened throughout all of this is seeing a Law & Order episode made based on you. <laughs> You probably haven't made the best choices in life. <laughs> if you're on a Law & Order episode, to see the actress like reading your death threats made for TV, that's weird. It's really weird. Um, this was the Sci Chat Fly Channel version of the same thing. This is television Brianna Wu. So, yeah, I don't think they nailed that uh, because... <laughs> They cast my husband for this, too. He's a lovely guy. I follow him on Facebook. Um, my husband is Chinese, and they cast a Japanese guy for this. So <laughs> there's this great scene of this actress. Like, um, after she gets the death threat, she's like in the bottom of the closet crying. And it's not exactly how it went down. But, um, yeah. I guess the other thing I want to come back to before I finish up the policy perspective and get to questions is I just want to tell you it is nearly impossible to do your job and to be dealing with being in the center of a controversy. You know, for me, like getting, there's no way you would have to be a robot to get those level of death threats and that level of doxing and that level of personal attacks on a daily basis and not have it affect you. <coughs> and the truth is, the PC version of Revolution 60 coming out it was very far delayed because I was so quagmired trying to deal with this stuff. Working to get prosecutions, we failed. I did everything right and we failed. I cannot think of any advantage anyone could have for getting prosecutions that I didn't have. We had hundreds upon hundreds of articles written about us. We had friends in, uh, you know, politics, we had friends in Congress, we had friends in law enforcement, I had connections at the social media companies that were happy to work with uh, law enforcement to hand them IP addresses for credible death threats. I had money. We had somebody that was, her whole job was to like find and locate the people that were sending me the death threats. I actually have the name of the man that sent me that death threat they made the Law and Order episode about. I gave that to the FBI, I gave it to Homeland Security, and I begged them to do something about it. So eight months into Gamergate, I get this message from the FBI. It goes, oh, yeah, you know what, Brianna? Um, all those meticulously detailed reports you've been sending us for you know, almost a year, we have never looked at any of them. We can't because of our security procedures. So uh, why don't you uh, throw them on a hard drive and mail them to us, and we'll see what we can do. Yeah, I did, and I got a read receipt back from the FBI, and that was the last contact I ever had with their office. Later, uh, there was a Freedom of Information request filed with the FBI. We found out they hadn't even looked at that information. They had done nothing with it. So as best as I can tell in the United States, there's no person in the FBI whose job it is to look at very credible death threats against private people and to prosecute them. I suspect it's probably going to be a different story if I get elected, but for private citizens, law enforcement is not going to help you. Sea Lion. My Twitter, even to this day, is a lot better than it was in 2014, but I deal with people just derailing the conversation constantly. It's, it is just exhausting to deal with. Um, you know, this was a Newsweek study that came out at the height of Gamergate, and, you know, um, for all the talk about being about ethics and game journalism, these are the two journalists, and this is Kotaku, and these are women, uh, Anita, me, and Zoe. We're not journalists, like we're critics and game developers. So it's not about that. So, like it's just pure harassment. This is all you're dealing with is extreme harassment. Like I said. Actually, this is a good slide before I get to questions. Um, I just want to say this. 
one of the most frustrating things I face is I have gone to Google and I have begged on my hands and knees for them to solve this problem. Do you know how frustrating it is to have certain YouTube channels that are dedicated to harassing and slandering feminists? And they make money on that? And like when I put out a video on YouTube, the next thing that comes up because they're so skillful at manipulating the SEO with it is to a video talking about like how terrible a person I am. And Google makes money off of that. So the thing is, everybody agrees that harassment is a problem. But the thing is, in actually solving it, in putting policies in place, in elevating women to a position of power where we can address these things, it's just not happening the way that it needs to. And the thing I want to say is, all of us have work to do. My biggest sign when I'm talking to someone that tells me they are part of the problem is if they, if they are unaware that they have any biases that they need to work on. For me, if you come to my game studio, uh, for most of the Revolution 60 core ship team, we are all white women. And when I put together this core team in 2010 and 2011, I thought I was putting together a really kick-butt feminist operation. And I myself had the blind spot of people of color. So for me, in my own work, I have that bias. I have to go out to network with more people of color and bring them onto my team and give those opportunities. If you're not asking yourselves these kinds of questions, if you're not holding yourself accountable, you are part of the problem. All of us have work to do. It doesn't make you a bad person to have these unconscious biases. We live in a culture that is wildly racist, wildly sexist, wildly transphobic, wildly homophobic. We just have to think our way out of it. And like, I also think that means we need to have a culture where if we make mistakes, we have forgiveness for each other. So I think that's actually a pretty good place to leave it. Uh, so. Three, three, four minutes. Yeah, three or four minutes left? Okay, fantastic. Uh, so, this was an event, uh, just talking about how the battle is continuing on. Um, this happened last year, so, yeah, this happened last year. I was on my way back from, uh, I do believe, South by Southwest. So this is after Gamergate. This is after, like, our, our, uh, you know, our industry is saying, like, mission accomplished, right? So I'm on a plane back and I start getting these pictures sent to me in my feed of schoolgirls. So what happened is basically Microsoft had a professional recruiting event for their Xbox division. <coughs> and somehow along the way, someone thought it would be a really good idea at a professional networking event to find engineers from Microsoft to have some girls come out and you know, dress down and to do a little strip tease on a pole. <laughs> you know, this was good. This did show some of the, the progress that we had made in our field because there was a really big backlash against this. Um, I talked to many of the people at Microsoft and they have cut, you know, their connections with this particular um, event coordinator. But at the same time, stuff like this is still happening all the time in the game industry. This is a really big thing, and I, I really wish more men in tech understood this. In the game industry and in engineering as a whole, networking really, 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 really favors men. And I can't tell you why it's like, every woman in here is gonna agree with me on this. How many times have you been in a crowd of all dudes and they're all just talking to each other? Yeah. All the time, <laughs> right? Also only eye contact with one another. Right, only look at other men. <laughs> and you're they don't want to be rude to us. Exactly. It's, it's, <laughs> it, at us is being rude. Or something. Or treating like a person and not a sack <laughs> of flour. That's, that's there is somehow rude. This is an uphill battle. Like, it's so hard to be there in a group of your peers, just trying to get those connections, just trying to make friendships professionally. It's, it's really stacked against you. And these same biases exist, you know, uh, with, you know, in groups of all white people against people of color. Sometimes as a queer woman, I can tell you it's a little bit awkward being there, like being around all straight people. So 
you know, networking culture, we really need to rethink some of the ways we do it. I'll give you a really good example. I can't tell you how many tech companies have flown me out to try to figure out why they can't hire women there. And then you'll look at their networking event and I'll be like, well, um, guys, I can't help but see that all of your networking events are at a bar, with alcohol, on a weeknight, <laughs> with all dudes, uh, with loud music. So if you think through this problem, who does that exclude? Anyone with kids is not going to be able to be there. Do you know many moms that are out at the bar on a weeknight? <laughs> I don't. Um, you know, if you've got alcohol there, that's going to make it feel more unsafe for, you know, a lot of women. And it's just these kinds of unconscious biases. We all need to start thinking through it. Another thing is the output of the industry. You know, I am a sex-positive feminist. I personally believe that we cannot have women's liberation without sexual liberation. You know, I think it's utter folly to try to erase sexuality. But at the same time, this is not something that puts like a, a welcome sign on your door for women. It's just not. You know, we've got to think about the ways that we portray women in the game industry. And I think it's so important that we design women characters Bring in women into your focus groups. These same rules apply for people of color and queer characters. Like, get those perspectives. Because there's a huge difference between representation and, like, being just a sexual object. Promotion policies. My favorite study on this came from Google, who is honestly doing some of the best work in the entire industry on this. They found out, really, it's true, uh, they found out if you have a 2% just a 2% uh, differential between who is hired, um, who is given a promotion rather, between men and women. If you're starting in your 20s and you go through your career at the CEO level, it explains our entire differential of why women don't make CEO because it's just this small slight bias all the way through your career. And you've got to understand it's much, much stronger than 2%. All of us have this bias. I have to fight it myself. I am, generally speaking, most comfortable with people that are like me, you know, other women engineers uh, that like video games, right? Like that's someone I'm going to have a really good connection with. It explains the team for Revolution 60. So all of us have got to, like, think about that bias. Google has a great study where they show, like, if you could just think of one thing that you're having bias on, whether it's talking to people in groups or asking yourself if you're having gendered assumptions when you come into a, a conversation. If you just try to keep one thing in your mind, you're going to have a better result. This is another thing that's really, really frustrating in the game industry. Any game that comes forward and gives even incremental improvements is instantly politicized. This was Tomb Raider 2013. This is, in my opinion, one of the very best games ever made. Uh, this game became a political fight where these developers uh, found themselves in a quagmire. They were called SJWs. They were called every name in the book for basically taking a character who before that point had been hypersexualized and trying to turn her into a person <laughs> instead, like a real character. You know, it's very harmful to have any of these small step forwards basically turned into political val uh, battles. So, you know, for me, um, I think, yeah, it's a longer talk. It's a great thing to end on. So this is from my friend John Syracuse. Uh, he's a co-host on my network Relay. He said this, I heard it, and I absolutely loved it. At some point, you have to decide, do you care about this or do you not care about this? You can't say, oh, I just agree with that on principle, but I don't want to do anything about it. At some point, you have to put your oar in the water. And that's why I challenge everyone here today to do. If you see the problem of women in tech, do something to help that situation. Be cognizant. Network with more women. Network with more people of color. When somebody is saying something that is, you know, homophobic, challenge them on that. Men, you have a superpower. I don't think you understand that you can talk to guys about their behavior and they won't scream at you or call you a bitch like they do us. Like, we need everyone to get involved on this on every level. And all of us have a role to play. So I think it's a good place to leave it. And thank you so much.
Thank you, Brianna. Who has questions? Raise your hand. All right, I'm going to just run around the mic. So we'll start with you, then we'll move to you, and then take it from there. So, is this on? Yeah. Okay, so thank you for the, uh, the very edifying talk. Um, I think that you've, you've put a very good case uh, that the problem of uh, abuse on the internet, particularly abuse against women and in, in the game industry, sure. is, is, a, is a social and a cultural problem. Yep. And I think therefore it needs a, a social and a cultural solution. Sure. But you're in a room full of uh, language technology experts, yep. uh, scholars, engineers, developers, uh, a very sympathetic audience, I hope. Yep. So I was wondering, as someone who's been affected in a negative way, by abuse on the internet, do you have any ideas of, of what we can do to help te technologically Yes. what we're best at? Thank you for asking this. That's a great question. Uh, if, you go, if you work at Google, please call me. I, need, I, have specific, I have specific policies that I need put in place at Google. I've been losing my mind. I've spoken at your campus three freaking times now. So I, I think this is, it's a, it's a two-stage problem. Like, we need people inside these companies doing work on it. And I think Twitter is a really good example. I personally believe Twitter has not gotten the credit it deserves for fighting this issue. It is drastically better today than it was two years ago. But we need you advocating before these products come out to not have the paradigm like encourage abuse. I'll give you a really good example. Twitter is a paradigm. The entire engineering team for this is men. You look at Pinterest. There were a lot of women involved in that engineering team. The entire interface paradigm, it's just not geared for abuse in the exact same way. So what happens if you put out a product and you don't bring in the perspective of marginalized groups? You end up with what I call sexism debt, or I guess you could call it racism debt too. Because it's not going to, it's going to work for one group, but it's not going to work for the rest of us. So if you're on these engineering teams, we need you to, you know, help us with this. Um, I would also say the reason I am running for Congress is we can't solve this without changes on the policy side. I've had conversations this week about one of the big things we need to change is apparently there are laws that if you all at Google or some other company start moderating comments, you're instantly picking up legal liability for that because uh, you're taking a certain amount of ownership over that. So like my job is to get elected and then write you guys a loophole. So there's just a, a whole list of things we need to do. But the, the first thing is to include other perspectives. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. I yep. wanted to follow up on your point about recruitment yes. and ask you about pinkification and sort of the ways that there's sometimes these misguided recruiting efforts that that <laughs> appeal to certain normative stereotypes. You know, you make the thing pink and of course women will love technology or you serve them cosmopolitans, you know, and, and you know, they'll yeah. be, like somehow yeah. Yeah. accessorize it. Yeah. And women will love it. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> um, if you could sort of say something about that. <laughs> My favorite thing I've ever gotten at a professional event is a lovely water bottle that probably costs someone about $30. And do you know who made this water bottle? It's Tinder. <laughs> and they funded a women in tech event at WWDC called WWDC Girls. And this was literally happening at the same time they were kicking Whitney Wolf out the door and stealing all her equity. Whitney Wolf is the woman that basically got Tinder to catch on. And they erased her and sexually harassed her until she quit the company. It is so much easier for a company to write a check for a catered lunch and to give away some cheap t-shirts than it is to really get down and address the problems. So I just really want to back you up on that. You know, women-only networking events, I do think they have some value. And the way we speak in, like, women-only spaces, it's a lot less guarded. Like, believe it or not, I'm being pretty guarded with you guys here today. <laughs> But, you know, it's not the only answer. And I think it's like you said, when you fall into those gendered stereotypes, you're just, uh, it's, it's, it's not helping you. So, thank you. Uh, all right. Yep. Uh, Meg, 
Yeah. Um, oh, I'll make it quick. Um, sure. So uh, I've, re I've recently started speaking out about the reality of um, being a woman in tech. And I want to know from you, how do you not cry at night? I do. <laughs> you know, like how do you not internalize it? If It's almost easier to suppress it so you don't have to face it than it is to actually talk about what's happening. And so how do you be productive without harming yourself yeah. in dealing with it? Um, my legs are in pretty good shape because I run seven miles a day. Right. Well, I don't mean self-harm necessarily. Yeah, but yeah. Um, honestly, badly. you can't. You can't do it without damaging yourself. You'd have to be a robot for it not to affect you. I mean, when the truth is, eventually, people calling you a cunt or a bitch or a phony or a fraud or a, you know, every name in the book, eventually it loses its bite. But the reason it loses its bite is because it's damaged you in some way. And that damage kind of keeps you safe, ironically. So. Um, I would say this, I think if you're doing this kind of work, it's really critical to make friends to talk to about this when it gets to be too much. Like uh, without you know, girlfriends to talk to, I would not have lasted this long. Um, don't be afraid to step away. But um, you know, if you're feeling damaged by this and speaking out, that's utterly normal. And you know, to me, you're a superhero for doing that because I know the cost firsthand, so thank you. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you have thoughts th about why it was that prosecution wasn't pursued, yes. even though you were basically handing it to yep. them. Literally and handing them the hard drive. Yeah, and then sort yeah. of <laughs> thinking yeah. towards the future about um, a law enforcement response to this sort of violence, yeah. but also earlier in, in the day we spoke about abusive language sort of um, in sort of youth youth and sort of at the K through 12 sort of stage engaging with young people about the realities of bullying. Absolutely. Um, and there we sort of had a bigger question about can this problem of violence, cultural violence, be addressed through law enforcement? I think, Not to say yeah, that yeah. there shouldn't have been a, pro I mean, th I think there should have been a prosecution for sure, sure but right. yeah. It's a difficult problem. I mean, anyone who's telling you it's an easy problem to solve is just not being accurate, right? Because we do have to balance, um, I hope nobody will mind me getting political, but like right now in the United States, we have a president that's trying to get all kinds of voter data, right? We collect data, there is a temptation for misuse. So for me, as a computer scientist, these are very difficult problems to solve. So. Um, I'll be honest, in being here this week, I'm coming up with different ideas. Uh, one thing I'm thinking about is from a jurisprudence level, as far as what like our laws are, if you're in a school, there are, is a much more legally simple situation around open speech and what you can or cannot say. So for me, um, after coming here this week, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get to Boston and announce that I think we should have some federal legislation to make it a requirement in a school district that if a parent comes to a school and says, my child is being cyberbullied, that they have to take that seriously, that they have to, you know, like work with social media and get those names and then have the parent-teacher conference. We'll need to do it in a way that, you know, protects privacy, but I do think that's something we need in schools. For me, when Gamergate happened, I was 38 years old. It nearly killed me. I don't think a 12-year-old child can be expected to have like defenses against this. You just can't. So I think like we need to have federal leadership now, because at least in the United States, it's just the Wild West. Um, as far as like for adults, what I believe is at the FBI, we had this interesting situation where the FBI was asserting jurisdiction. So Homeland Security or local prosecutors would try to get involved with that. The FBI would just leap in and go, nope, this is our case. But then they wouldn't assign anyone to it. So for me, um, one of the things I plan to, if I'm elected, to put in our first uh, you know, omnibus budget bill is to assign a unit, I don't know, 20, 10, 100 FBI agents, however many we need to fund, to take these kinds of really serious threats. I'm not talking like all women should be killed. 
like I'm saying, like X needs to die tonight. I think we need someone there to like prosecute those kinds of crimes. It's not even about the one person. It's about the social consequence of it, that letting people know that there could potentially be a consequence if you do this. So that's my answer, and I'm sure there are going to be other ones that come up as we work through the jurisprudence. All right, we're going to do two quick questions. You have Great. a question, Dick Haiwu, and then we'll move to the panel. Okay, so um, my question has to do kind of with your experience with other women. Um, sure. So there's that famous, okay, <laughs> that's not what I meant. But um, there's like a quote from Madeleine Albright, the sure. one about like there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. No, um, this so, expression was about that. I completely oh, okay. agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so um, my question was when you experienced this, experience, this whole Gamergate situation, yep. did you have... You, you mentioned that there's not that many women in the industry to begin yeah. with, so you all have to support each other, but yeah. were there other women that were kind of ganging up against you? Because, like you mentioned, they had to be passive in order to not get targeted <laughs> themselves? Absolutely. Okay, and how, Absolutely. Did you, how did you kind of deal with I don't with talk to them as much as I used to. So, <laughs> no, really being straight up. Like, there is a generational divide in the video game industry. And I do have some women friends that are my age or older that are friends. But I think like there are some people that grew up in an age where the way they survived in the boys club was to be one of the boys. And it's just how they operate. And they're dangerous to be around, like, just to really be honest. So I think like you kind of keep your political distance from them. Um, what I am seeing is with many Women, they're millennials, I think there's more of a we're all in it together attitude that's permeating. So I think it's changing. Um, for me, I have a professional policy to not go after other women, like in a public way, ever. I just don't do it. Like, there's not much stuff on my Twitter critiquing Ivanka Trump, right? <laughs> because I just think, like, we get. I think like culture pits us against each other so much of the time. I just don't want to participate in it, even if it's worthwhile. But yeah, unfortunately, women are mean to other women, and that's just a fact. So, a lot of the reason I'm running for Congress is because, you know, honestly, harassment is part of it, but it's it's not my main reason for running for Congress. I mean, it's economics, it's uh, cybersecurity is a really big issue, but I think more than anything else, we need. You know, Star Wars is like a story of a generation rising up and taking their place and kind of changing the world. And I think we are at a point right now where, you know, baby boomers have, they've been in charge since the 90s, since I was a teenager. And now I think it's time for people of my generation to kind of stand up and run for office and, you know, serve our country in that same way. So I think it's the time that all of us need to pick one of three things to do. Either you need to run for office yourself you need to donate time to someone that's running for office, or you need to donate money that's running for office for to someone running for office. You know, tweets aren't going to change this. You know, we need very direct action. So that's a good point to leave it on. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Bianca.